projects because he's not only you know, one of the few black professors that we have here in the Netherlands. Um, she's not only an intellectual. I think for a lot of us, she's also you know a role model, a person we can learn a lot about. And what I like about Professor Messerlis is that she doesn't limit herself to you know armchair science, just writing about, talking about. She's also involved in <coughs> the new generation, in the movements, in yeah the things that need to change here in society. Um, so I can still talk for 30 minutes about her resume, but I think it's much more important to you know acknowledge and 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 um, yeah tell you the work that she has been doing over the past few years. Especially now, she's also part of the commission. On diversity at the University of Amsterdam. So although she, yeah, she's the Emerita, so she doesn't work at the University of Utrecht anymore. She's still very much involved in decolonizing education, decolonizing this society. So with that being said, I would like to ask you to give you a, give Professor Lecker a warm round of applause, and now give the stage. This meeting was going to be in Dutch, uh, which was my mistake because I see in the program that it is to be in English. I prepared something in Dutch, um, but I will be speaking in English to you. However, once in a while, I will be uh, giving a very short synopsis in Dutch. So I hope all of you will be able to uh, follow. And then uh, maybe if some things haven't been clear, you can ask me questions later during the Q&A um, period in Dutch. So I want to welcome you all tonight at this third presentation of my book, White Innocence. Um, I see family and friends, uh, MF, uh, I see a lot of uh, students and ex-students um, people I work with uh, on the uh, University of Amsterdam committees that I'm a part of. I'm uh, really happy and honored that you have come in such great numbers. And I also want to expressly thank uh, New Urban Collective for organizing this evening and for all the important work that they are doing and have been doing in the past five years. Um, also the people of Ons Suriname. I think it's very appropriate and important that we are uh, having this meeting here, the oldest Surinamese association in the Netherlands, where so many illustre uh, uh, predecessors have stood and worked and made plans for a better future of Surinamese people, both in Suriname and in the Netherlands. The past weeks have been very festive for me. Um, um, so I've had a, a book presentation at the Tropical Museum, the Royal Tropical Museum. I've had my farewell address at the University of Utrecht on June 15, and now this presentation. Um, there is a lot of interest in the book, more than I had expected, I have to say. Uh, honestly, one doesn't expect that a book that is written for one's colleagues uh, to attract that much attention from a general public and from the media. And this is the case of, uh, for people and media both. Uh, nationally and internationally. The book has now started its journey into the world, which is always, um, it's a moment of uh, farewell to the book from me. Uh, it has never been only my, my 
property. It is thought that I have developed in collaboration with other critical thinkers, both in Europe and in the United States. I think of the book not so much as a child, as often as the metaphor that is used for books. I think of the book as a ship that is uh, that I have built with the help of these other critical thinkers and that has now come off the ramp and it will start a journey into the world. Um, I also, I hope that uh, you, when you read the book, will feel something of the urgency and the passion that is behind the book and also of the necessity that I feel to make a more palatable, a more just, and a better space of the Netherlands for all of us who do not look uber Dutch. That is to say, <laughs> the ones who are not white, people who have their roots elsewhere and who are not necessarily Christian. <clears throat> what what I'm interested in is expressed very clearly by Toni Morrison. She says in uh, the article Home, um, I have never lived, nor have any of us, in a world in which race did not matter. Such a world, free of racial hierarchy, is usually imagined or described as dreamscape, Edenesque, utopian, so remote are the possibilities of its achievement. How to be both free and situated, how to convert a racist house into a race-specific yet non-racist home, how to enunciate race while depriving it of its lethal cling. Uh, I want to translate this into Dutch. Dus wat Tony Morrison hier zegt, is een citaat wat me heel erg aanspreekt. Wat heel belangrijk ook is voor Nederland. Waar streef ik naar? Um, zij zegt, ik heb nooit geleefd in een wereld waarin ras er niet toe deed. Nog heeft een van ons dat ooit meegemaakt. Zo'n wereld, vrij van raciale hiërarchie, wordt meestal voorgesteld of beschreven als een droomlandschap. Zoiets als Eden. Utopisch, zo ver verwijderd zijn de mogelijkheden om die wereld te realiseren. Hoe kunnen we tegelijkertijd vrij en gesitueerd zijn? Hoe kunnen we een racistisch huis ombouwen tot een rasspecifiek, maar niet racistisch thuis? Hoe kunnen we ras articuleren terwijl we tegelijkertijd ontdoen van zijn dodelijke steek? Dus hier gaat het om. Hè? We willen niet kleurenblind zijn, zogenaamde kleur. We don't want to be um, suffering from so-called color blindness, as if we supposedly do not see any color. That doesn't serve any purpose. Um, on the other hand, there's still much less to be said for the current situation, which could be summed up by uh, the situations that Silvana and Typhoon have just gone through, where we see that open racism is, um, is, is uh, that racism is openly and without any feeling of shame uh, uttered, or any profiling is um, defended as good common sense, logical, rational, as the um, leader in parliament of the conservative uh, party is doing, Halbe Selstra. These past weeks have yielded actually a lot of material that I want to go into when I start to work on the Dutch version of the book. As I said, I wrote the book for my colleagues in gender studies, in cultural studies, in sociology, 
But I have noticed, and it has been brought to my attention, that it is felt to be very important that there will be a Dutch version of the book. I will uh, work on that starting November, when I finished my work at the University of Amsterdam. And I will take into account everything that has happened these past uh, weeks, because uh, there are such interesting illustrations of white innocence, uh, the open racism that is uh, uttered and that is defended as common sense, as, as good, good sense. Um, so I also want to uh, mention uh, one other experience is that many journalists have complimented me on the good timing of the book, my <laughs> great uh, foresight that this book needed to come out now. Uh, but I, uh, uh, against that, I have to state that I have been working on this book for the past 20 years, ever since I came back from the United States, where I had done my PhD. So had it not been Silvana or Typhoon, I am quite certain that uh, material would not have lacked. So what I want is that <clears throat> the often unconscious, lazy chains of association that are linked to different racial ethnic positionings are broken through radically. That is to say, I do not want that the images that precede whites are always already and automatically meaning good, this is an enlightened person, an intelligent person, this is normal, while black stands for uh, being in one's body, for a bodily state of being, for being uh, strength, uh, strong, uh, but stupid, strong and stupid, uh, which are linked, uh, for being very funny and um, invoking sexuality, while Muslims are associated with the return of religiosity, with senseless violence, terror, and backwardness. So these <clears throat> chains of associations, uh, Tony Morrison calls them lazy chains, that have been implanted in our cultural archive, in that what we have between the ears in our hearts, uh, these chains should be radically um, dislodged. They first should be brought to the surface and then deconstructed and dislodged. Uh, I want to tell you something about <clears throat> the content of, uh, of the book uh, and also uh, to work towards speaking to the question of who are we as Dutch people, and I mean Dutch in a very inclusive sense, all those of us who are here to stay, who uh, have either been born here or who were raised here and who want to have a claim to Dutchness. In uh, 1989, there was a book that came out, The Empire Writes Back, um, by Bill Ashcroft and other authors. It is about post-colonial um, English literature. And I see my book like this in the Dutch context. It is a book that um, initiates a conversation about a new topic. Uh, it is the Dutch colonial empire that is writing back to its formal, former colonizer. Uh, where my colleague Philomena Esset, and I'm not sure whether Philomena is present tonight, um, she already started writing from the end of the 70s about everyday racism. Um, I have turned my gaze to the people 
from the people experiencing racism to the people who are benefiting from racism and who are perpetrating it. So I'm asking centrally, what has almost 400 years of colonialism done to white Dutch people? But let's not flatter ourselves because what it has done to white Dutch people also to uh, a large extent has been done to black people because many black people have internalized many of these messages. It is not the case that just because you are black you have a different cultural archive. You need to work on that archive and see what uh, in it doesn't serve you, what in it comprises racism. So um, it often seems to be the case that to be successful in this society as a black migrant or refugee person, um, you need to um, be a part of the same dominant discourse that many Dutch people have. And the Dutch discourse um, prominently says, you know, it's not all that bad with the racism here. You should not um, be so suspicious and so sensitive. It's, it's, it doesn't serve us. Yes, of course, there are a, a couple of um, crazies on social media, and um, they say nasty things, but that doesn't go to say that much. So <clears throat> this is not innocent. Or equally uninnocent is the choice that is often made uh, for who gets to speak for black people on television it often turns out to be people who are uh, participating in this white dominant discourse that belittles racism consistently. And I myself had that experience recently when I was on Buitenhof. Yeah. go back to my main <coughs> argument uh, with regard to the dominant Dutch self-image. What I'm asking is how is it possible to think that that elaborate empire that had a lot of longevity, it lasted for close to 400 years, and in some respects, with the Dutch Antilles in mind, we could say it's still going on. How is it possible to think that the possession of that empire would not have left traces in language, in culture, in history, in all kinds of domains of social life, in the way institutions are organized and in the ways in which we imagine the self and the other? I think that is a very valid question to ask. How would that be possible? Um, often the, answers, the answer to that question is, well, it took far, a place so far away from here, in the East Indies, our Indies, or in the western part of empire that we in the Netherlands didn't have any repercussions as opposed, for instance, to the slavery and colonialism that took place within the borders of the United States where, you know, it was all very close together. Um, I also um, ask that question because it offers such a convenient way out for the dominant um, discourse on who we are. Um, so what I have done as an anthropologist um, who's very interested in cultural studies and in um, gender studies, I have written an ethnography of the white Dutch 
self-image. Who are we, basically, as Dutch people? That is what I'm asking. So what does that dominant self-image look like? It is a rosy, self-flattering self-representation. We are a small country. We are progressive, colorblind, and anti-racist. We identify ourselves with the position of victim, for instance, see World War II, and not as a perpetrator of violence. We have uh, a principal <coughs> difficulty of um, thinking about ourselves as perpetrators of uh, violence, either in Suriname or Dutch Antilles, but also um, in the two wars that we waged against the independence of Indonesia in the period 1945-1949. This um, reluctance to speak about ourselves as uh, perpetrators of violence is very well illustrated by the term that we use. We do not speak about wars, but we speak about policial actions. It's a very euphemistic term, actions by the police, which make it sound very light, uh, light corrections were taking place. And so far we have also refused to do research into the violence that was perpetrated there. So we are actively excising parts of our history um, that are not flattering to ourselves. Um, we also see ourselves as, as ethically very elevated. We are a beacon and a, a, an example to others. In these days, currently, this is symbolized very much by the tribunals that are um, taking place in the Hague. But this um, very high regard that we hold ourselves in is also very noticeable already during colonialism, uh, and it is noticeable in the journal De Gids, which is uh, the journal for the bourgeoisie, to read about matters of the empire, mostly about our Indies, which um, has a wealth of attention in that journal, and maybe one thirty-fifth part of the publications in the journal are about the western part of the empire, which also speaks volumes about how these various parts of empire are evaluated in the Netherlands. But what happens is that one person, Meyer Raneft, he writes that it is providence that the quietest people of Asia, the Indonesians, have been brought into our care, the quietest people of Europe. This is spoken about as a match made in heaven. So this self-congratulation and the assumption that colonialism is uh, beneficial for all parties um, speak very loudly from this uh, quote. So innocence is at the heart of our self-representation. We didn't know and we don't know that in our name all kinds of misdeeds and violence has been done in the form of slave trade, slavery, and imperialism. And this is also where the book, the reason book Roofstaat van Ewald van Vught, um, talks about and gives us, you know, it's a very thick book. Uh, he gives us uh, a lot of insight in that part of Dutch history, which so far has been neatly kept out of our national history books. So we didn't know, we don't know, and if we did know, we didn't mean it that way. So my thesis is that the defense of that innocent self-image, consciously or unconsciously, is the motive of all that passion, aggression, and, and anger that 
takes hold of many people when the R word is laid on the table. So we see that uh, from the Swartopit uh, question, and I hope the Americans here have learned about Swartopit. <laughs> have you? Yes. yes, okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so uh, what is at stake there is that we, in the face of many signs to the contrary, want to maintain that this is not racism, that we are innocent, and that the people who oppose Swartopit are uh, really um, making a big thing out of an innocent phenomenon, and they want to take away our culture from us. Um, so black migrant and refugee people touch an open nerve when we question that innocence, when we doubt it, God forbid, when we <coughs> deny it. Um, so there are many, many, many um, other examples that illustrate this deep-seated feature of um, the dominant white Dutch self-representation. I want you to think about an episode from 2013. It is um, on television, uh, and um, there, there is um, Umberto Tan, who is a black talk show host. He's visiting a white colleague, Jack Spikerman. And uh, Jack Spikerman is asking Umberto questions about soccer. And Umberto doesn't know the answers to this question, these questions. And then Spikerman says, good grief, black and uh, uh, stupid to boot. This is an iconic example of how, with the help of humor, racist content is brought across in the Netherlands. It's a very prominent way to use humor to uh, make racist statements. In the first instance, Spikerman says very self-assuredly that he is such good friends with Umberto Tan that he can uh, permit himself uh, to make uh, these statements. Uh, but then a little storm arises and then uh, he uh, offers his, his uh, uh, he says he's sorry, he says he didn't mean it this way. Um, this sequence is rather standard in the Netherlands. And I analyze loads of these uh, events uh, in the media and in real life, um, whereby I all the time um, do an intersectional analysis. I'm, I'm not paying attention to gender, but also to race, ethnicity, to class and to sexuality. Um, so the material that I use, that is my um, uh, source material, are media, TV programs, uh, literary texts, my own and other people's experiences in everyday life, important institutions in society like government and the academy, I also uh, analyze popular culture, like the figure of Swarta Piet. I do an analysis of a historical case study from 1917, in which five white women go to their psychoanalyst complaining about that they suffer from hot and tot nymphae. Um, this term is never explained. It is supposedly a, a term that circulates widely in upper class circles, in medical journals and the like. It is, Hottentot Nymphae is the term that is ascribed to black women who supposedly have enlarged labia minora. So these white women go to their psychoanalysts and say, we suffer from Hottentot Nymphae. And the psychoanalyst says, Nonsense. You have masculinity complex, 
So what we see is that the women offer an understanding and the psychoanalyst wipes that away and says, I'm understanding you in terms of a misplaced gendered feeling about yourself. You, you want to be men, you want to be successful, you want to occupy the position of men. And so I'm analyzing, so what is going on here? The substitution of race, the substitution of gender for race, and what's more, what's going on in 1917, when our dominant understanding that has carefully been brought across is that we didn't know anything about race in the Netherlands in 1917, because race only came to play a part after the Second World War, when all these people from Indonesia came over. So that really rattled me, you know, the, uh, this, this unsuccessful but very powerful drive to excise race from the Netherlands when this little case study shows that it was very, very, very present. The last um, chapter, the last analysis that I do in the book is an analysis that was brought to me on the basis of uh, during the elections of 2010, that among gay white men, PVV, the populist right-wing party of Geert Wilders, won the most votes. Among lesbian women, it was traditional leftist parties that won their vote, but I wanted to really delve deeper into it. What is happening here that these white gay men are supporting a xenophobic, anti-Muslim populist? What is in it for them? Then I uh, reasoned back to Fortan uh, because he uh, was also so very striking in this paradox that he embodied in um, having a lot of objections to Muslims. He hated Muslims and thought they were backwards and they couldn't be accommodated in modern society like the Netherlands. And on the other hand, and at the same time, he chose uh, young Moroccan boys as his favorite sex partners in dark room. So I was wondering, so how can these two things that seem rather exclusionary of each other, how can they be reconciled? How can they be thought together, basically? And that brings me back to the cultural archive, because that was exactly what was happening in the colonies. Uh, a, a distinct disdain on the part of white colonizers for black people, black women, at the same time, they were the favorite sex partners. So I'm, I'm, I'm extending an argument that still, to my mind, um, has not been done in the Netherlands. These are not things we like to talk about. We like to say, what, this is such a good sign that we have this number of mixed relationships. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say anything about the quality of these relationships, nor that these issues are talked about, eh? uh, what is in the cultural archive, and what also plays out in these relationships. So to me, it's very short-sighted to, um, you know, again, flatter ourselves about how, how well we're doing. Mm -hmm. OK, I think I'm going to have to go, go a little quicker, but I've been telling you about what the book is on. And um, so I want to say something briefly at the end about how I feel about how we should proceed and uh, about also how I often feel in the Netherlands. So I have a paradoxical feeling of being at home here. This is my home. I have different homes. This is also true. Uh, but this is one of the most important places in my life where my family and loved ones are. I'm 
I wasn't born here, I was one year old when my parents came here, uh, but I have been raised here. Um, and when I'm away from the Netherlands for longer periods, I have a really uh, nostalgia for, for Amsterdam specifically, not so much for uh, other parts of Amsterdam, <laughs> I, I really miss. Um, but at the same time, I have the feeling that my claim for Dutchness, on Dutchness, is not unproblematical. It's not self-evident, it's not without contestation. My claim is too often questioned and doubted. I'm not one of the Dutch automatically. On the contrary, uh, on the basis of what I look like, I'm often excluded. I will never, um, um, you know, end the relationship with the Netherlands one-sidedly, as Nadia Esseroyli uh, did a couple of months ago in the Volkskrant. But I also do not think that this love can be one-sided. And where is this one-sidedness? evident. Um, it is often, uh, and it is quite painful that this often takes place in professional contexts. Um, it's at the university, NIAS, uh, where I started writing the book at the end of 2011, where people very in a very friendly manner speak to me in English. Now I can think, well, they think that I'm American. Wow, I'm too, too interesting. But what I really think is, why is it not possible to be a learned uh, black woman and still be thought of as Dutch? That combination is an oxymoron. It cannot be thought. So um, that is still a rather innocent practice, the more insulting and negative one is when my status as a professor is openly doubted. Are you really a professor? Or did you get a token appointment? So, uh, as is often asked me, uh, which is a typical, very direct Dutch way, which people like a lot, you know, to say it like it is. Um, I'm interested in the fact that uh, Bram de Swan, who is a sociologist, um, talks about an experience in which he goes to the hospital and he, has a, he gets a doctor who has an afro, a black man with an afro, and he catches himself that he thinks in the first split second, Hmm? What is this? I, I, I want a real doctor. <laughs> um, and he, uh, he realizes in the next second uh, that racism uh, is part of his archive, that that is the first reaction that he has, the first unreflected reaction, and that he has to, to work on this. So. These forms of microaggression, it's, uh, it, it, this conglomerate of toxic associations that I started to talk about, are anchored in our cultural archive. This is a, a concept by Edward Said in Culture and Imperialism, and it is a, a, a place in which all kinds of ideas and thoughts and frames of reference, but also affect feeling about the world, have been collected. And I'm saying this is the basic uh, thesis of my book, that 400 years of colonial regime, of empire, have planted rays into our cultural archive in an undeliable way. It is not to be thought away. It needs a lot of work to become conscious of the place of race in our cultural archives, how it intersects with gender and with sexuality and with class. And we need to work at that. All of us need to work at that. 
So my plea actually is that in further forming the society, uh, which is um, inescapable, uh, we have to develop more consciousness about how we have become, who we have become, and which um, differences and commonalities we have between us. I actually think that we can only talk about we when the dominant ethnic group uh, develops more inside in its own genealogy and its own unearned privileges and we ourselves as blacks, migrants, and refugees in Dutch society also have lots of work to do. Um, in ending, I want to speak the words of Audre Lorde, which hang above my desk and which really use, are useful to me and, and I hope will also be useful to you because all of you will find yourself in situations in which it is important to speak up, to voice what you're thinking and not to be silent, not to go along with the dominant racist discourses. What is it that Audrey says? When I dare to use my words in the service of my vision, then it doesn't matter whether I'm afraid. That's what I said. If you think you don't need to read the book, you should. <laughs> You're even more motivated to read it now. Um, well, it's time, I think, at least we would raise a lot of you know, questions uh, about this uh, topic, related topics. So we'll continue with a dialogue with two other very special guests. Uh, I'll start with Ador. She is a student member of uh, the University of Color and African Students United. Uh, she came here with her beautiful mother and her brother, Kenneth. Um, and she's also a student of ISV, Interdisciplinary Social Sciences at the University of Amsterdam, a few minutes from here. Um, yeah, please join the stage. The second person I would like to invite to the stage, uh, lots of you will probably know him, or think you know him, but you may have no idea about what he does. Um, most of us know him from the campaign Zwarte Pieters Racisme, um, which he started uh, with a few people a few years ago, five years ago, and that campaign, I think, Changed the course of history when we talk about race and racism, decolonization in the Netherlands. But he does a lot of different things. He uh, does much more. Describes himself as an artist, still a student as well. Uh, at one of the schools, you can explain yourself, I think. But please, uh, yeah, give a warm applause to Grace Guy. I find myself so. <laughs> can I? Yeah, can I, can I start off by saying that um, I was speaking to um, Mr. Vaira beforehand, and what's amazing is if you look around, the gender of those in the audience is really remarkable. It's majority yeah. women. Yes. Yeah. 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 Why is that? Why is that? Why is that? Um, but I think it's, it's, it's an important question to ask, but it's an important aspect of, of us being here to, to know it. Um, where where are the men? Were they just too late with the with the emails? <laughs> was there no base? What's what's do they have no interest in 
in, in Professor Rector's work. What is going on? You right here, man. Well, over the past five years, I have to say, we've been organizing a lot. Um, and I have to be honest that the majority of the people who do the real work I really want to uh, uh, recall that during the first anti-racist uh, movement, it was also women who took the, uh, up the forefront. So what is different now is that um, you know, like you two are really uh, persons in the forefront, but I am always aware that it is women who form the majority of the movement and who do all the work. So it is really, um, I think, important because this is the difference between these two waves. We as women came into the foreground during the first um, anti-racist movement. So I really would like to call up women of this generation also to be more visible in the movement, which is not to take away from the work you are doing, but I also want it to be uh, more equal um, uh, visually, let's say, and, um, in, in the contributions that that is acknowledged. Thank you. It actually all really touches upon my first question. Um, because I was at the, 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 the first presentation of the book at the Drogue Museum, uh, where Quincy also was one of the uh, people who received uh, one of the first uh, copies of the book. And uh, I put it on Facebook, I made a video, put it on Facebook because I found it such a yeah, profound moment, you know, a moment where you really kind of saw, you know, two generations of anti racist uh, thinkers, uh, intellectuals, activists, uh, yeah, black people, three coming generations. together. Three, three generations indeed. Um, and also this building, when I look into the crowd, I yeah, not only see um, mostly women, but I also see different generations. Um, so, in this one, one of my questions, um, also in the book, and during a few of your talks, you've talked about, you know, the, the, of the past years, that the second wave of anti-racist activism has started. Um, what would you say are, you know, differences and, and similarities between the generations? And, yeah, what do you think yeah, should be done to yeah, continue the collaboration? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, maybe some of you guys also want to speak to that, or, not, or don't you? You, you, you first. <laughs> okay. um, um, so yes, I uh, already mentioned this gender aspect, which is a difference. But what, uh, to me, what is most uh, important is the emergence of social media that have made this second movement possible and have made it flower in that you're not dependent on traditional media to spread the word and to organize, but that you are independent and autonomous in choosing which actions you take and how you organize. I think that is incredibly important and powerful. Um, I think Somehow the tone has also changed. Uh, Filomena said that when she was uh, speaking here. Uh, um, black beat is black grief was the slogan in our time. And now the slogan is black, uh, black beat is racism. So it uh, is a very different flavor to those two expressions, which I find really uh, significant in that you're not beating around the bush as maybe we did to a certain extent um, in those um, in the 80s so um, yes those are some 
important differences. Um, and I think that we have never before had such visibility to the struggle and such numbers who you are able to mobilize. That is really admirable. I'm really so very happy that <laughs> the second anti-racist movement came into being. I've been waiting for it a long time. We've been waiting for this book for a long time as well. I think yeah, both of you are part of this uh, second wave of anti-racism. Professor Levy just mentioned it, it's not the previous racism. It's one of the things that came out, popped out of your creative, uh, creative mind. Um, you know, the difference between Swatapita's racism and <coughs> racism and the slogan that you just mentioned, Swatapita Swatfidli, which my mother used to uh, say. Um, yeah, can you yeah, tell a little bit about your you know, your views on this, in, this intergenerational exchange? Well, I, I think it's also a question of that literally I'm, I was a student of Professor Records. So you can actually say I, I was radicalized by following your courses. <laughs> <laughs> and in that sense, I think what's interesting about anti-racism, anti-racism work, um, in everyday language is uh, a lot is looked at the U.S., for instance. So when you talk about the anti-racism legacy, it's U.S.-centric, while the courses I took from Professor Record were really European-centric, were Dutch-centric. So there was a reconnection with the history which was taken away in everyday conversation about what racism was and how it manifests itself. I mean, different locations have different ways of presenting it. And I think that was, that was really necessary and key for my understanding, okay, what is it that I'm experiencing when a classmate asks me, how big is mine, right? Those type of things. Yeah, but yeah. Um, and I think what was, what was important for me in that sense, because initially when I came to this shirt, a lot of my friends who are now up front we're like, uh-uh, we're not doing this. <laughs> Racism, that's not a word we use in the Netherlands. And I think it's also my background coming from the Dutch Caribbean, coming from St. Martin, and, not, and having a different um, visual archive of the possibilities and of the positions that people of color can take in society, that I reacted differently. And I resisted differently, I think. And in that sense, it's a reconnection to the Dutch context, but also to my own local context of Curacao, of St. Martin. I mean, I come from an island which... Carry on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I come from an island which, in 1969, on the 30th of May, pretty much tore down the city because white and Dutch workers of Shell were paid differently. So there is this struggle, there is this history, this legacy of resistance which is already ingrained in the way how I talk about um, slavery and, and people who have been enslaved. I mean, in, in, on St. Martin and on Curacao, we don't really celebrate the 1st of July. We celebrate the 17th of August, because that's the day that Tula led a rebellion against the white slave masters. So it's a completely different ideological view and ideological position to think of about what is it that we do to change our current situation, how do we look at it. And, um, thank you. <laughs> this is, um, this is John Leibnant, and he made a film about the 30th of May based on archival footage, and then maybe you can talk about it later on. So it's, it's interesting in that sense where you have this rich collection, this rich tradition, and the moment you start getting involved in this, you also connect to people who have been writing from their own pockets in the Netherlands about these type of issues. One of the people I met um, because of my arrest was Flavia Tzolodon. She's in the back there. <laughs> She's a radical feminist um, Argentinian writer based in the Netherlands who has been writing about this for the last 15 years and writing for big publications like The Guardian and Tiger Beat Down. But people here haven't, haven't heard yet that much about her. So then when you, when you touch base with all these places, you realize, hey, there's more going on than what the dominant culture, the dominant media let us, let us in on. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, what I have experienced is that, first of all, I was born here. I have been raised here in the Netherlands, but I have a Ghanaian background. What I have experienced in, uh, not elementary school necessarily, because I was in a multicultural class, so I never had a feeling of being an outsider in that kind of space, because there were Surinamese people who looked like me, there were Antillian people who looked like me, there were Moroccan people, basically, there were there was a class of marginalized people all together, so there was never a sense of being an outsider. <laughs> Only on the fact that on an individual level, if you had weird clothes or if you talk weird, or if you had hubba, for example, that was like a <laughs> I don't know for all the Dutch like people who grew up here, but that was like a basic thing that if you had something dirty that people would like avoid you. But I have experienced the first time that I I had a conscience of like that being um, being a racist caricature was on high school, and it was by the same um, yeah. It was not in the same environment. It was a bit more white as I was um, as you called it like a higher level Fabio student as they call it here. That was the first time that. Uh, I got confronted with that image, and it was my gym teacher who was dressed up like Black Pete, and then the other person who was next standing to me, another student who was standing next to me, said to me, whoa, you really look like that. <laughs> and then I, I was kind of shocked, I mean, how could that person see the link between me and Black Pete, and then all of a sudden, it was actually really logical because it had the same skin color as me, it had the same thick, thickness of lips, it had the same hair texture. It all became clear to me that this is a repetition of oppression that is perpetrated upon students, and that they internalize that, and that they spread it upon me. And not only me, but also other black people who were on that high school. Um, I don't know much about the inter intergenerational um, difference, but what I do know is that this this movement seems way more mobilized due to social media. Due to that, the platform is way bigger and way more pronounced, and it can spread more faster. And it's just in a way that. Critical theories about race can be spread faster because of the internet, can be reflected on faster because we can critique it on comments. We have Facebook groups. We have so many different ways of connecting the same struggle. And yeah, I think that that is the, I, I think from my perspective, that is the key difference between this generation, that generation, and also the fact that we, I think that this generation says it as it is. It's racism, and that's it. It's 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 ridiculizing the black image. It's ridiculizing a a, a feature which we were born with, and it it's just yeah. It's 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 a repetition of yeah of oppression and it keeps on continuing itself. And this one instance, uh, also in high school, was it that, yeah, people asked me to be Black Pete. <laughs> I said no, and then some other like fellow students said to me, like, oh no, but you can, you can dress like Black Pete. I mean, you don't have to put the smink on, you only have to put the earrings on and the red lipstick, put the outfit on, and then you'll be Black Pete. Oh no, but you're Black Pete also the rest of the year. Wow. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're glad that the new movement started. I, I want to go back, uh, we'll take questions after the break. I want to go back to a particular slide because she just yeah, mentioned it briefly. Let's see, it was one of the first ones. Yeah, this slide. So this is a slide uh, with the flyer of our very first event, June uh, 9, 2011, Excellence Equals. Um, we had you know all kinds of speakers, as you can see it was you know really focused on you know career development. Uh, the best out of yourself, excellence, you know. Um, a little bit neoliberal, but 
That's right, yes. <laughs> but what I found interesting is that it was June 9th, and there was an event with speakers. We had uh, you know, a few bankers, entrepreneurs. Uh, it was really about career development and personal development. And all of a sudden, Quincy came in with you know, this t-shirt saying, that, so what the Peter said, I said, well, <laughs> although I, I agreed with the statement, I also thought, hmm, maybe this is not the right place at the time. But what I find interesting, and it touches upon the conversation that we had about you know, differences between generations, and, you know, these generations may be a little bit more direct, a little bit more you know, outspoken, uh, which is uh, yeah, symbolized by these different slogans. Um, and also when we look at you know, these spaces, especially at the university, but also other uh, educational institutions. Talking about issues like race can really make the place a bit uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how you, know, you have experienced this working as a professor for you know, several decades in these very white institutions in the Netherlands. How did you deal with Yes. Well, this is a real uh, issue that you bring up. Um, so I was teaching in Utrecht, where the majority of the students were white girls. Uh, I only, I think I can count on the fingers of two hands the students of color I've had in almost 20 years. Um, so that in itself is a worrisome thing that um, gender studies apparently is not something that black students think they have anything to get from. Eh? Um, and um, especially because it is one of the few places in the academy, or it was, uh, where one could learn about gender in addition to race and sexuality and class, which is not self-evident that it will take place in sociology departments. But that being said, um, I find in general, and that was also the case in those Utrecht classrooms, that my talking about race and the kind of terminology that I used I didn't use autochton and allochton. I used black migrant and refugee people. Um, was kind of shocking to them. They were kind of taken aback and sometimes were looking at me like with their mouth open. Because this is one characteristic also of racial situations in the Netherlands that we do not have a well accepted general discourse to talk about race. Um, you know, like we like to talk about ethnicity, which is also softening and sweetening the bill, but it is about race. Let's be frank about it. But that in itself, because it runs so counter to how we think about ourselves, it's like cursing in church. Look in the camera to talk about race. And so the, the terminology that I used and that they used was clashing very sharply often. So people didn't think twice of, about using the N word, you know, talking about neger, no problem. Uh, so when I would then uh, use black, then some people would catch on, but not everybody would catch on. So there is a lot of um, space we need to cover there, that we learn a vocabulary to talk about race and racial differences and not uh, dodge from the issue, because that is the preferred mode. Eh? Let's not talk about it, then it doesn't exist. And then we can continue with white innocence. So we're glad we have this book. And um, there's a chapter where you write about this, I think it's chapter two, the house 
the house that raised Bill. So then you have to put the Delphine Bill. Yeah, we just discussed it a little bit with all different generations, and I wouldn't say that the dollar is special and very different, you know, movements, uh, yeah, moving cycles. You know, we have uh, different times throughout history, the 60s and 70s, where you had a lot of movements in the 80s as well. Um, but over the past years, you know, we had the beat movement, but also the, yeah, the new student movement, um, especially last year, where the Magdalen House, uh, which is the seat of the board of the University of Amsterdam, was occupied for a few months. Um, and I was there the first night, the first evening. I found it very interesting to see that there was this, uh, you know, space, a very prestigious uh, building in the center of Amsterdam, occupied by these students or even staff members, uh, mostly white. And there was a conversation between the chair of the University of Amsterdam, and she's not the chair anymore, mm -hmm. no one, um, <laughs> and the mayor of Amsterdam, Van der Laan, had to come to, you know, kind of mediate between these parties. And I found it very interesting because a few months before that, and even the, the past few years, Van der Laan has been one of the persons who has done a lot of, you know, he's been very problematic in the black beat thing. Uh, so I thought, <laughs> if these were black students, would Van der Laan be here mediating between angry, righteously angry students and stuff? Wait, I think, I think we need to understand what happened. Okay. Um, so Van der Laan shows up and there are these privileged students, white students occupying the building, right? So when do they actually get kicked out? The, the, have you heard that story? After two months. Yeah, after like after a while. They were in there for a good while. Now what happens is all of a sudden the security guards said that Moroccan kids were in the building. And that was the argument that was used to kick them out because Moroccans could never be students of the UVA. And then is when they charged in. So the racial element of the removal of the stopping of this occupation has never actually been dealt with in public fora. They've always talked about they were destroying stuff and, and it was just a question of money and the need to get out. So there as well, there's this silencing of the violence done to Moroccan bodies, or Moroccan bodies seen as threats, as, as criminal elements who could never be there to get an education, right? All of these connections, and I was invited as well to come and speak and I didn't do it. Out of fear that I would be connected to something, and then what I've understood afterwards is that a lot of people um, know what they did afterwards is that they took fingerprints of all of, in all of the spaces to see who did what where. You, you guys didn't know this? <laughs> <laughs> started throwing around these numbers about how much damage was done, I realized, okay, who, whose fingerprints do they have in the system? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And who exactly are they going to go after? Who exactly is going to be the guilty party? You already have the Moroccan students as an excuse yeah. to go in. Which students from this occupation will be the ones who get the bill on their doorstep? And so when I decided not to go there, I felt ashamed a little bit because I wanted to support Yet at the same time, I was thinking to myself, let me not make it worse for myself, because already a lot of a lot of stuff was was happening. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so what, was, what was interesting as well was that a few months before, so that was in February, and let's say November. Um, yeah, I was part of a yeah, non-violent protest at the. National Saint Nicholas Parade. All we did was get there with a teaser. We didn't occupy anything. We didn't occupy a building or things like that. And more than 60, 70, yeah, mostly black people got arrested immediately. Mm -hmm. So it was quite violent. So it was interesting to see this difference. Um, fortunately, within that space, within that very you know, predominantly white space, you know, a new group arose. Uh, began the University of Color, 
I don't know you're a member of the University of Color. We've been collaborating with them as well. A few of them are here. And yeah, can you tell a little bit about um, yeah, the University of Color and <coughs> your experiences as a you know, black student at the Viva? I think you also prepared a question. Well, I'll first answer the questions that you have posed me and then I'll put my own question. Uh, the University of Color is a students collective who aims to decolonize the university because it is revealed in the University of Amsterdam that basically even in philosophy where thinking should have not been given a limit, it's limited to only white, male, European, enlightened thinkers. So to have that curriculum of only Voltaire speaking, well, as he has said, very racist, xenophobic quotes about especially black people. And what if you are the student of that Afro, Afro, um, Afrogenetic background, reading that and knowing what damaging words he has said about people that look like you. What does that do to your mind? And also not only to black people, but also to white people. What does it do to their minds? Is it a, um, is it a affirm affirmation that white is the only way to, to analyze things critically? If you only are offered that kind of people who talk about scientific issues, and talk about theories. That's that's what that's what it recreates, and the University of College tries to stop it because there are so many other scientific scientific people that were dominant, not not necessarily dominant, but had a um, had an important had an important say within those fields, not only in philosophy, but also in psychology, sociology, etc. How can you exclude those voices who have been also critical to understanding certain phenomena that you want to analyze, that you want to understand? That That is really, yeah, how, I don't get that. It's like having a rainbow, but only including red as the rainbow. <laughs> yeah. And so the university college tries to stop that, and we, yeah, we have, the, we have come to um, a commission not only with the university college, but also in the Urban Collective, and the United worked into that. And uh, Professor Becker is also in the commission, which I'm very thankful for that, especially with her book White Innocence, and her being critical about this curriculum that is press, uh, that is uh, spread upon uh, students, so I know. So I'm very thankful for that. And yeah, we try to, we try to critically um, underline what kind of oppressive mechanism is behind only speaking of white as being the ultimate in intellectual way of describing certain things that happen in this world. So we try to stop that because but for my Ghanaian background, Kwame Nkrumah is a very important person. He was um, a Pan-African Pan -African president who aimed to not only decolonize the, the effects of what colon colonization had upon Ghana, but also decolonize the people of, the, of Ghana, of the damage that has been done that the, that, yeah, the British Empire had a lot of people. And yeah, now I'm also a black student, the only black student, only dark skinned black student. Let me let me emphasize that because you have other black students in the um, yeah, not many, maybe two or three <laughs> who are probably of mixed race, like half half Dutch, half Surinamese, or half I, I don't know their genetic background. But it is I have what well, I have noticed is that because they see me, like a really, really outsider that does not look like them, they rather interact with the, the other um, black people who look more like them. 
than with me, and I have noticed that. There is a fear of coming towards me and having a normal conversation, and they hold themselves back, especially for the fact that I am very outspoken in, in, in lectures. Like for instance, I had this one time that I, um, um, that a um, white, uh, yeah, of course, white, but white female, uh, yeah, I say of course because it's it's dumb, the, the teachers are predominantly white. I have not been lectured by any teacher who was not white, or I haven't been in, in the lectures, but I don't know, but I have not experienced that. But basically, she had an image of the Black Panther Party. And she uh, she held a a quantitative uh, lecture about how you should uh, do quantitative research, quali no qualitative research. And she behold the image of the Black Panthers as an example of a gang. Oh. Yeah, as a gang. And I immediately stopped her. I said, No, the Black Panther Party is not a gang. It's a social activist group. Yeah. And then she she was flabbergasted that I even had the audacity to said to say that she was like no 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 they were a gang I have looked it up they are a Chicago gang I said no no they were not they were absolutely not you can check again but maybe you have intermixed like maybe the Crips with like Black Panther parties I don't know. This is one of the ways that being black and also being outspoken as a student is, yeah, actually I'm, I'm giving myself really bad rap in like the teacher's office. <laughs> really bad. I don't know, there's only like one white teacher that really um, kind of supports me but not talk to me. He's also a bit safe, but he allowed me to talk about privileges in a presentation, so I think that he's a... Uh, Kind of look, looking out like, do, yeah, do you like that? Yeah, <laughs> like this. <laughs> so yeah, that's one of the experiences of being a black student. Oh yeah, and I also had a question about white innocence. Um, and uh, Professor Wicker, um, the way that um, racism is prevailed, in um, especially when you're white and privileged, is that it's. It comes from the unconsciousness, and that it's a process that you cannot necessarily control because you have no influences, influence over it. But I see this as a lie. I see it as an excuse to not ad ad admit that you have certain thinking patterns, certain attitudes towards other non-white people not only black people, but Moroccan people, Asian, everyone who's not white. So my question is, how can we underline the conscious processes of racism that is portrayed, especially from white people? Yes. Okay, well, here. I, I also want to underline, as to your earlier narrative, that the painful thing is to see how not much has changed eh? after 45 years. I was a student at Ulfa 45 years ago. Uh, together with Claudette, we uh, studied cultural anthropology. And I mean, the sensitivity to uh, people of color was kind of non-existent. I have also recall having experiences when I made a very good book review or a paper, that the teachers was, were asking me, did you, did you make it yourself? <laughs> so um, it simply uh, was, again, an oxymoron to be a black student and to be performing well. And so um, this structure, this, this uh, thing that I have called white innocence, I think it is very important to, as it were, keep it, uh, to consider it as unconscious, because then again, there's not that much that you can do about it. But it is based on a Western conception 
of a Freudian conception of what a person is, that a large part of who we are remains unconscious to ourselves. Whether, whereas when you take a different conceptualization of a person, um, unconsciousness doesn't play such a large part. So it is, it, it fits, you know, with the master narrative, let's say, of personhood in this society to keep it in a corner where racism belongs to the unconscious realm. And I think we need to get beyond that. Somebody who writes very beautifully about this is Avery Gordon, black sociologist, oh, yeah. who writes about haunting and who has a very different conceptualization of the person and consciousness. And she, uh, on the contrary, is, is talking about how we are different entities eh, within one person. And it is not uh, accepted as axiomatic that a large part of those entities are unconscious. She recently gave a speech at uh, Stone in, in Den Haag. It's an it's a art, art space. Um, I, want, I want to touch on something that was said about the notion of ethnicity and who's the ethnic, right? In the Netherlands right now, if you call a white man a white man, he's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Which I find fascinating. In, in the sense of, I, I wrote an article um, a week ago in the national newspaper and um, uh, where I talked about this one guy who wrote an article where he mentioned me and said that my tone was the reason why racism and anti-racism uh, wasn't, wasn't working. And I was like, what tone? Are we still on that level? That you want a tone? So, in the piece, um, um, rhetorically, I slap them around a little bit, and then I present an alternative canon. But what people, an alternative canon of what the Netherlands could look like, or what my Netherlands look like. And then I mention, I mention uh, you, I mention Kwame Marco, Glenn Willemse, his daughter is here, she, she told me, and there she is, yeah, which is cool. Um, sorry, uh, Glenn Willemse. Yeah. Could you raise your hand again? <laughs> and and um, what happens is that not the content of the piece sticks with people, but the title that the NSA picked which was white man don't tell me what to do. <laughs> which is interesting, right? Because I didn't pick the title, but it was inferred on the piece. And now what happened afterwards in the, in the school setting, for instance, um, a tutor of mine um, by the Art Academy decided not to assess me based on my work, but based on this article, which was written. What? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which I find fascinating. <laughs> fascinating that you can still smile. Right? <laughs> but did he say so openly that he was? Uh, how did? Yeah. You... Well, in in the assessment that he sent me, um, he wrote about how uh, after the conversations we've been having the whole year about my work, he realized that after reading my text, he does not have the right to speak anymore. <laughs> so that I silenced him. Oh. Okay. Which is interesting, right? This notion of who is exactly is being silenced in these conversations, even in the definition of what's going on. While some people call it a debate, other people call it a struggle, right? While some people try to rhetorically minimize what's going on, others are seeing it as life and death, and also seeing it as an understanding of dealing with what happened with Mitch Enriquez, for example. And it's these type of ways how rhetorically in these institutions of power white men still have certain access to ways of determining for you yeah. how you how you can excel or how you can yeah, yeah. move forward. Yeah. So I think one of my questions then is um, how do we not only talk about this in a way that they can listen and if we even need to? Well, um, you see um, I, what I see in this teacher's attitude is really 
uh, a turning of the tables eh, in that he positions himself as a victim of you, <coughs> that you are more powerful than him to uh, determine the terms of your contact, which is kind of outrageous. Eh? Uh, I mean, um, uh, given his position as a teacher and you are a student, so um, I, I also tend to see it as a preferred practice uh, when uh, you know you you do not really want to engage with the issue that is at hand, then you start talking about tone and about how you are victimizing him and, and making uh, him less powerful. I think it is important to uh, point out these mechanisms that um, are playing out. I don't know, you know, whether he will react to it in a uh, way that he can move forward or that you can move out of that space that you're in now, but it would seem really important to be able to talk about it because otherwise, you know, I, I wonder what kind of future you have with him as a teacher when he thinks that about you. And, and so it's not only important in terms of how you will move forward and what your trajectory will look like, but I think it's also important uh, to do that because of the structural character uh, of what you see happening, the mechanisms that are in place. We're running a little bit behind schedule. As you can notice, luckily I don't see anybody sleeping yet. Um, so, about ours, the last question touches upon, touches upon what we have uh, just discussed and then we'll uh, have some time to let everything sink in to, to get some fresh air and a drink. Um, so we talked about you know, these mechanisms that uh, white people, white men in particular, within these institutions often used to derail uh, conversations about race, racism, uh, the legacy of colonialism, etc. Um, give an example as well, very recent example. Last week I was part I partake, I partook in a seminar at the KNMA, so very prestigious you know, scientific oh, council. You're going places. <laughs> but uh, I was the only black person, of course. Not, you know. But the interesting thing was that this was a seminar, four-day seminar about education and inequality. So they had, you know, the best lecturers, the best scientists of the Netherlands, even a few from abroad, to talk about this issue. And not one was about that. not even race, not even ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So we had gender, we had everything was social class. We had um, you know, different perspectives from psychology, philosophy. And every day I had to say, okay, but you know, what about what about race? What about <laughs> ethnicity? You know. Um, and they all always said, yeah, you know, when you control for social class, yeah, this is not, it doesn't make such a big role. Um, fortunately, we've, you know, we've had occupation, we have the commission now at the Duva, um, and your are chair, so we're very happy with that. But your main thesis in the book is that after 400 years of colonialism, you know, it has left a legacy within the Dutch cultural archive in the, the ways we, that we think, that we feel, that we talk, within our institutions, um, which, is, which could make it hard for us to change a thing that has been built up over 400 years. So my question is, how can we you know, change this thing of white innocence and, and could take an example of the UVA, where you are you know, uh, the chair of a commission uh, with the aim to achieve sustainable change. Yeah. How can we yeah. make the change? Well, this is so huge, <coughs> Mitchell. And uh, sometimes I'm afraid of the expectations that uh, 
exist around this committee yet, that we are going to change the world in the next four months. <laughs> and I, that we're not going to be capable of doing that. We are going to be scratching uh, the service and uh, what is uh, very important, we are going to aim for putting mechanisms in place that it doesn't fall away from the agenda that there will be a unit or a, a, a group of diversity officers that will monitor this process after we are gone. And uh, students also, by definition, are a floating population. They come in and out. And it cannot depend on the uh, fortuitous presence of students or student movements for the University of Amsterdam to pay attention to diversity and decolonization. But it's a huge, many-sided problem that we are looking at. And um, what I said earlier, uh, a number of things are in play here. Um, so what we see is that talking about ethnicity, has started to happen when we look at primary school level. The recent report about children of blacks and migrants getting worse and lower school advice um, than uh, people who, who uh, than children who have highly educated uh, parents speaks to this. So in the primary school level, we have managed to have some kind of, of, of discussion about that. But it doesn't go very <coughs> deeply. But the difficulty with the university is that part of its self-image is still this Olympus where there is a meritocracy, where people come on the basis of their excellence, not on the basis of color, or not on the basis of gender or class, it is their brains that brings them there. And that is irrespective of where they come from. So in that Olympian thought, there's a lot of self-congratulation going on. Ufan, the dominant ideology is we are the most egalitarian institution in this country. We are progressive, we are liberal, liberal when they are not here, these people of color, it is because they're not ready yet. But it's not because of us. We are open and we uh, invite people to come in here. So this not talking about race is fully uh, in, in, in uh, you know, in uh, accordance with this self-congratulatory Olympian ideology. So, are we going to be able to abolish that as a commission? I don't think so. We are certainly going to talk about it. What are some of the issues that prevent UFA from being a more inclusive institution? Making it more conscious. Yeah. This is the problem. Do you have short comments on this issue? Or will I have The UFA has a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's